consciousness on a plane of duality where, you know, it gets crazy. How can we expect to go into this life without some downers, without some things happening to us, like wearing a white suit in a coal mine? And so I was thinking way back, long, it's going to be 30 years this year, or is it 40? I don't remember anymore. But before I came into Unity, I took a Psychology 101 and learned about Albert Ellis. And he had a list of three must-haves, must you know, must, M-U-S-T, must in your life, that, that can keep you from sustaining that joy or that peace or that pleasure or whatever. And so I'll read them over first and then we'll go through each one of them separately. But the first one is, I must do well. The second one is, you must treat me well. In other words, do what I want you to do. And the third one is, world must, the world must be easy. All the while, we're wearing a white suit in a coal mine, you know? So let's look at those individually. First one, I must do well. How's that working for you? That one never quite worked for me. Such high expectations, isn't it? That every day going down into that coal mine with the collective consciousness, we're supposed to do really well. And this, I'm showing my age again. I keep doing that. Anybody remember the actor Glenn Ford? There's got to be a few of you that remember Glenn Ford. Oh, thank you. I'm not the only one. He, there was a movie he was in called Tea House of the August Moon. And there was a quote from that. I don't remember the movie much, but I remember the quote. He said, I have made peace somewhere between my expectations and my limitations. And I carry that with me because sometimes we expect so much of ourselves and we expect so much from each other. And if we can somehow make peace between the expectations and the limitations, so repeat with me if you're comfortable. I release any shame of not being enough together. I release any shame of not being enough. Especially if we compare ourselves to others because there's always so many others that are doing so much more and there are others that are doing so much less. And so we can get into that comparison game. Now, I don't know how many of you have Amazon Prime and watch Amazon Prime, but there's a new documentary out with Garth Brooks and his wife, who are opening up a new bar in Nashville on Broad, and it's called Friends in Low Places, this famous <laughs> song, right? And I think we love that song because we all like friends in low places because we can feel so much better than if we have a lot of friends in high places, you know, there's that comparison. But he said he wants it to be a bar where everyone is welcome and everyone is loved no matter who you are or where you've come from. Sounds like unity, doesn't it? I think we should make a field trip, a church field trip <laughs> to friends in low places. If somebody wants to organize that, I think that would be fun. Okay, well, we got that first one squared away. All we have to do is go to the bars. So the second one, the second one is you must treat me well. In other words, do what I want you to do. How's that one working for you? Is everybody treating you the way, being the way you want them to be? I had another great awakening on that one when I read somewhere that relationships are not there to make us happy. What a novel idea. We're not there to make anyone else happy and they're not waiting. We're there to make us happy. What a relief. It's an inside job, right? Only we can choose to be happy. Only we can make it happen. We don't have to have that pressure of being what other people want us to be or having them be what we might want them to be. Okay, the third one, and this is the one I've tripped over a lot over my life. The world must be easy. Things should be easy. I always think, you know, things should be easier. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking through sand in this life. Things should be easier, and I'm still waiting. And when you get into that mindset, you resist the challenges, and you, you don't always receive the full blessing of those things that may be a challenge. And going along with that one is the strange belief that bad things only happen to other people. Anybody here feel that way? The first time it dawned on me that I had that belief, 
Uh, most of you know my, my first child, the doctors came in and told me she might not make it. And you know, she'd only had a short time left to live. And when, when I was told that, I had the strangest thing go through my mind. And it was, no, that can't be happening because those kind of things don't happen to me. They happen to other people, they don't happen to me. And I realized later how stupid that was to think that because they do, they did, and they are while trying to wear a white suit in the coal mine, you know? Things happen. I saw a younger version of me on a photograph one day, and I was embarrassed remembering how clueless she was. <laughs> Do you ever go back and think, oh my God, I was clueless? There's an old saying, if you're not a little embarrassed at a younger version of yourself, you're not growing. <laughs> so man, am I growing. I, I can be embarrassed looking at old scrapbooks. After the resurrection, the disciples and friends of Jesus were walking along. You know, they didn't have planes, trains, or automobiles back then, so they were walking to Emmaus. Now, I'm not talking about Paul on the road to Damascus. I'm talking about Emmaus. And they're walking along, and they're really sad because Jesus has died, and they haven't heard of the resurrection yet. And they're talking about how sad they are and how distressed they are. And Jesus shows up and starts walking along with them. And he's kind of egging them on. It shows the sense of humor. You know, hey guys, what's got you down? What are you talking about here? And, and they're going on and on and talking to this stranger. And he's trying to speak to them about spiritual things. And they don't get it until they finally sit down and have a meal together in the breaking of the bread. They recognize that Jesus is there with them, that Christ is among them. And it's such a great metaphysical story. Remember, metaphysical means what is that person, place, or thing in that story in me? Well, how is that story in me? And that's when I'm in that coal mine of life in my white suit, and I'm getting all dirty and torn up and stained. But Christ is among us. I'm not alone. I'm a part of the divine all the time. So I would add one more to the list of El Albert Ellis, and that is, we're not alone in the coal mine. If you'd repeat with me, in the midst of life, I live in the divine embrace. Together, in, in the, the midst, midst of life, life I, I live in the divine embrace. embrace. <sighs> <sighs> now, Emmaus, metaphysically, a place in consciousness where healing and the restorative love and life and truth of spirit spring up and allow to flow freely through our being. In this collective consciousness, that state of mind allows that flow that we sang about this morning to flow through us as restorative healing life, love, joy to bring us back to that higher place. And as we move up the spiral of life, there are bumps along the way. There's highs and lows. Although I've always seen that when I get really low, it's almost always followed by a high. And the lower I go, the higher I go. Really interesting if you keep track of that. It's almost like a propulsion that pushes you back up higher. Repeat with me if you're comfortable. In the midst of life, Christ is among us. Together, in, in the, the midst, midst of life, life Christ, Christ is among us. us. And how about this one? I have made peace together. I, I have made, made peace, peace somewhere between my expectations, somewhere between my expectations and, my and my limitations. What a relief. What a relief, huh? Now, the resurrection is just the beginning, and that happens in the mind. It always starts in the mind, because that's where the thoughts, the beliefs that shape it all take place. And we have a lot more to look forward to after the resurrection. Now, I may be setting the bar high today, but hang with me, okay? There's a word called regeneration. And Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, the co-founders of Unity, really believed in the regenerative regeneration, the power that we have to regenerate the body. You know, the life force flows through us always, and we have the power to heal itself. Now, it doesn't always happen. I seem to have a lifetime of having to deal with things in my body. 
and I have to surrender to some of that and balance it with knowing that I can uh, lift myself up through prayer, through what I can. I accept what I can't and pray in, you know, what I can. So, but the divine idea of life is constantly renewing and regenerating, and the body has the ability to heal itself. But most of the blocks are all those subconscious programming and beliefs and suppressed feelings and emotions that are stored in our body. Our body is a storehouse of old stuff. And we gotta go into that coal mine and dig it, dig and dig. And let go of separation thinking. You know, when Jesus said your sins are forgiven, he meant let go of those old memories and stuffed in emotions. Let go of the unforgiveness. Let go of the guilt and the shame. Let go of all those thoughts of not being enough. There are ways to get out of the coal mine. And the easiest is to accept your divinity, accepting your union with the divine. And this one seems a little lofty, but it's called translation. Did you ever hear of translation? It's when the body translates into a light body, very close to the transfiguration of Jesus. Charles Fillmore said the supernatural change of appearance that takes place as one experiences the full flow of divine power through one's being. Wow. And we see it on people sometimes. I remember about a year or so before my mother died, she was spending the night with me and we were laying there in bed talking to each other and I looked over at her and her face was shining. She was absolutely glowing with light. We can touch that, we can experience that at times. And then there's the ascension. The body and soul rise up to another dimension. Jesus ascended on a cloud. Moses' body was never found. He disappeared somewhere. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind under a chariot of fire. It could have been a UFO. I don't know. And Mary traditionally ascended. They celebrate that. Called Ascension. Th I was born on Ascension Thursday. Tradition has it that Mary ascended. And it may seem lofty, but others have done it like a blade in a fan. When the fan goes so fast, it disappears. Another dimensional vibration. The ascended masters and yogis, the Mayans, the Anasazi, what happened to them? Other enlightened ones. Okay, I might be setting the bar a little high here today, but repeat after me. I made peace somewhere between my expectations and my limitations together. I made peace somewhere between my expectations and my limitations. And I plan on buying a new wardrobe for the coal mine. Maybe it'll be blue jeans and a sweatshirt. How's that sound? And we have to transform that coal into diamonds and let those lights shine and shine. Let's take that into prayer. Ah, divine presence, you are in the midst of us in this coal mine of life. And we wear the white suit of your embrace, that healing light that lives, moves, and has its being in and through and around us. And as we release and let go of our old stuff, as we release and let go of the resistance, we go with the flow of spirit. We allow spirit to take us higher. We allow the healing, the restorative power, the strengthening, the lifting up, letting go of all resistance and simply floating on the movement, the flow of spirit. And we are so grateful for this time, this place of allowing as we pray in the nature of the Christ. Amen.